I'm a pen tester. That's what I do for a, a living. Uh, I have a background in IT. I've probably in, been in the industry for 12 years now, um, either between IT and, and security. Uh, and basically the genesis of this talk was I used to be uh, a bank pen tester and uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, pen tests in the bank, but it's, uh, it's very like Windows focused and AD focused, and, uh, very like local infrastructure, that type of thing. And uh, one of the things I realized as I was looking for new research opportunities was that there is some research in the cloud arena in terms of offensive stuff, but uh, there's not as much um, you know, it's not even close to what there is in the, in the Windows world. So the idea behind this talk was like, okay, if I'm on a pen test and I land on a developer's box or an IT person's box and I get access to some AWS uh, API keys, what would I do with them? I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you, like, what, what would that look like? And, uh, you know, that was where I, where I started off, uh, you know, uh, at the beginning of my research. And uh, basically, this talk has morphed into uh, some, some things that you can do, uh, both some tools that I've written, as well as uh, some tools that other people have written. So uh, basically, we're, some of the things we're going to talk about are, uh, you know, what is AWS? Uh, if you're not super familiar with uh, the cloud and, you know, you're very, you're still, uh, you know, heavily in the local infrastructure AD uh, space, or if you're familiar with Azure and you're trying to kind of uh, uh, curious about AWS and what makes it different. Uh, we're going to talk about what a AWS API keys look like and how to find them. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, tools to help you. Uh, so that's going to be uh, a small uh, a small selection of AWS CLI. Uh, so this is a, a, a tool uh, called the AWS command line interface, which basically allows you to run commands against the AWS API. And there's uh, a Python SDK. There's other SDKs for other programming languages, but the one I uh, primarily use is OTO3, uh, which is the Python uh, SDK for AWS. So it allows you to do things that, in a more advanced or uh, scalable way than just using the, the command line interface. It allows you to programmatically interact with the API rather than just typing commands. And I've got some examples uh, from a tool that I've written called Red Dolphin, which is a collection of uh, AWS uh, offensive scripts. And I'll show you some examples out of that tool. Uh, also talk about some other really valuable tools uh, that I haven't written and have been written by other people uh, that you should definitely take a look at. Uh, they're a little bit more like uh, oddity or, uh, you know, they're the louder tools. Uh, mine, you know, the ones I'm going to be talking about are, are kind of like scalpel uh, tools. Uh, the, the other tools that I'll be talking about are, are, are a little louder and uh, do uh, do a lot more things, but do it loudly. So it's definitely going to, you know, hopefully, you know, would be detected. <laughs> um, this is version two of this talk. I did a uh, an earlier version of this talk last year at DerbyCon. It's basically called the same thing. So if you, you know, Google API keys, now what, and DerbyCon, you'll find it. Uh, it has a couple of different things that I removed from the talk uh, that were sort of unauthenticated, didn't involve API keys, and I sort of refocused the talk around authenticated stuff when you get access to API keys. So uh, with that, we're also going to talk about uh, some mitigations, sort of what do you do. Uh, to counteract some of these things uh, that I'm going to show you, and we'll talk about those uh, closer to the end. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Uh, I think Phil is uh, kind of monitoring them, and, uh, and uh, I'm fine to stop, or we can wait till the end. I'm fine with that, too. So let's talk about what AWS is. When, mo when most people think of Amazon Web Services, they, think of, they may think of these two things, OK? Uh, Elastic Cloud Compute, or EC2, is Amazon's virtualization. It's kind of like Hyper-V in the cloud or ESX in the cloud. Um, and you might think of S3, which is uh, shared storage. And you interact with these on a daily basis, whether you know it or not. Uh, AW, or, uh, S3 is uh, sometimes a little bit more obvious. Um, 
but it's uh, used a lot in serving static content. Uh, so you, you use both of these uh, probably many, many times a day. Uh, so those are the two things that most people think about when if they know a little bit about AWS. There's plenty of, uh, there's so many things that I, I learn about new stuff that AWS does like like on a weekly basis. There's all kinds of stuff that it does. Um, but to sort of make you a little bit more comfortable with AWS, I'm gonna show you uh, a comparison. It's not a perfect comparison. You know, AWS is not Active Directory in Windows, but it's like, uh, there's a little bit of uh, commonality. So. If you think of Windows, there's all these components that Windows can sort of be broken into or installed on or, you know, whatever. And, you know, Windows Active Directory, Hyper-V, file sharing, Exchange, DNS, databases, certificate services. And these all do something, okay, that are hopefully valuable to a business. And they all serve, you know, a function, okay? So Active Directory is your identity and access management. Uh, you know, SMB is your shared storage, et cetera. And in similar, but not exactly parallel ways, Amazon does uh, a lot of this stuff too. So, uh, and they do more and uh, they do some things that Windows doesn't and vice versa. So, uh, but again, the, the focus of this talk is primarily going to be about EC2 and S3. We are gonna dive, we're gonna touch a little bit on uh, identity and access management, which is sort of like where all of your permissions and uh, accounts and stuff live. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about logging as well, which is called CloudTrail. Uh, so that's what AWS is. Was there another slide? Okay. So uh, I'm going to refer to the AWS console uh, a lot. And I think people hear console and they think like it's like a terminal, like a you know Linux terminal. And it's not that, it's the web GUI that you can interact with uh, AWS with. And this is how most people, when they're getting started with AWS, interact with AWS, I would say, uh, especially when they're learning it. It's a bit of an old screenshot. Uh, they've actually just updated it again. So it looks, I would say, slightly nicer than this. Uh, uh, if you log into it today. Uh, but basically you've got a navigation bar that lets you search different services. You've got a, a context aware menu, you've got regions, and then you've got like data about what you're looking at. Um, and one of the cool things about AWS is that it has this concept of regions where you uh, can put resources close, hopefully close to where they're gonna be used. So rather than having your users in Ireland or Southeast Asia log into your servers in Oregon, you could hopefully have infrastructure a little bit closer to them. Um, increases performance, reduces latency, you know, all kinds of uh, ideas there, right? So you can, you can uh, kind of get lost with the regions and I've tried to write my tools in a way that uh, compensates for that uh, so that you don't have to be super knowledgeable about how the region structure works. Um, but it, it can make things a little bit complicated and you can spin up virtual machines in a region and then sort of forget about it and meanwhile you're being billed for it and, and that type of thing. So, so the API, uh, let's, let's talk about the difference between the console and the API. So when you authenticate to the console, you are using a username password. Hopefully you're using multi-factor authentication you might be bouncing through a SAML provider optionally uh, if you're you know, a, a more mature organization. And this is how you authenticate to the GUI, okay? So there's a lot of you know, things that you need, especially if MFA is enabled, to uh, log into the console. But the nice thing about API keys is if you got the API keys and there are no restrictions on the API keys in terms of you know, connecting into AWS, you're authenticated. And you don't you don't have to worry about multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, you're just authenticated. You're good to go. So we're going to talk about ways to lock that down later. But uh, you know, this assumes that maybe the organization isn't super. You know, doesn't have a, a person that's an identity and access management uh, expert. And you've sort of gotten a hold of some API keys that give you some level of of permission. So. 
this is what an API key looks like. It's a key ID, which you can sort of think of as like uh, the username a little bit. Uh, these are example keys. Uh, so uh, not, not actually usable. Um, you, uh, where do you find API keys, right? You can find them in code or on a file system. You can even find them in environmental variables. So many AWS tools support reading API keys from environmental variables. So you'd be surprised at how often you find them just like if you get, get a shell in the box, you just dump the environment variables, you might, you might be able to get uh, uh, some, some API keys. Uh, file systems are, you know, if you get a shell on a developer's box or an IT box or somebody who has access to the AWS environment, you're probably going to look in a file called, uh, in the home folder called .aws is the folder, and then a file called credentials. And then there will be profiles. Uh, there may be more, more than one profile uh, that is sort of a, a group of credentials. So this is a default profile which uh, is sort of the assumed profile when you authenticate against the API. Uh, you could have, you know, a test environment and a staging environment and a prod environment and, a, you know, whatever other environment. Uh, so you can have multiple credentials in just this one file, which is uh, a dead, uh, this is the first place you look basically. There's another file, file called the AWS config file. It's less useful, but it, it, it does, it may give you good intel in terms of where uh, the person that uses that machine primarily works out of. So it may be a good place to start uh, looking for stuff. So continuing on with searching for API keys. So let's say you get access to some Git repo or you get access to some sort of uh, source code, you know, source version control uh, system and that has a search uh, facility uh, built in. If this is what an API key looks like, there's all kinds of things in here that we could query for. You know, AWS, access key ID, secret access key. Uh, there's also weird ones. So like AKIA is a very uh, common one. Uh, all access keys start with that. There's other uh, prefixes that a key ID can start with. Uh, but for the type of uh, API keys we're talking about, they're, they're probably all going to start with AKI. This is from AWS's um, reference. So they actually tell you what all of their uh, key IDs start with. So. Um, if you do have logs that come out of your source code version control system or something like that, uh, where you can sort of tail the logs and look for suspicious queries, this may be a good area to, uh, to alert on, uh, on these types of queries, you know, when people are looking for passwords or secrets or that type of thing. So keep that in mind. Another place you may find API, uh, API keys or other things uh, are, there's a couple of ways to do implement infrastructure in code. Uh, the first is AWS CloudFormation. And CloudFormation is Amazon's uh, preferred way of doing this. I don't know how some people use it. I don't know that it's as, as widely used as Amazon would like it to be. Um, because there's another option that is, I think, a little bit better, and that's called Terraform. It's made by a third party, it's open source, uh, made by HashiCorp. And basically, so this is, in this example, you can see it's actually a bash script embedded in something called user data. We're going to talk a little bit about later. Uh, but if you got example to a Terraform file, which has usually has a file extension .tf, you might be able to get, uh, you know, it's not best practice, but sometimes people leave API keys in there. Sometimes they put uh, information into scripts and stuff that they shouldn't. Uh, it also just gives you a lot of information about the environment if you can get access to these files uh, because it shows like how they provision. And a side note about Terraform, uh, very powerful. So like one of the things you can do and one of the things you're worried about when you're in AWS is like, is this going to cost me a fortune to run a bunch of 
instances that are billed like at a fraction of a fraction of a penny per hour. And uh, with Terraform, what you can do is you can, uh, with a few keystrokes, you can like spin up a bunch of virtual machines and then you can destroy them when you're done doing whatever you're doing. So it's actually very good for like test environments um, and whatnot. It's, uh, once you get to know uh, AWS a little bit, uh, learning Terraform probably takes maybe a day or two. It's, it's, uh, it's really great. So the tool I wrote is called Red Dolphin. Uh, it's an AWS attack framework. Uh, it uses uh, BOTO3, uh, which is the Python AWS SDK. Uh, the reason it's called Red Dolphin is because Boto is a dolphin in the Amazon River, and I was like, it has to involve dolphins somehow. Uh, so it's it, right now it's eight scripts, but it's growing, and uh, definitely pull requests are welcome. Uh, if uh, you see something you want to fix, let me know, and uh, we'll make it happen. And I'll show you some examples of what some of the scripts do. So one of the first uh, scripts that is super useful is uh, ties into identity and access management and it is used for checking your keys and it's called check AWS key and what this file does is it tells you one at least one very important thing is are the keys valid right because sometimes you can get access to API keys that are that have already been rotated six months ago or two years ago or whatever and like the people just left them in there because it's like, well, they've been rotated, so I don't care. Uh, it also tells you other information, like what groups the member is a part of. Do they have MFA configured, that type of thing. Um, so that's what Check AWS Key does. So once you have a valid key, uh, you want to know a little bit of situational awareness. And so I have a, a script called Describe Trail Status. And basically what it does is it goes through all of the regions and checks to see whether or not CloudTrail, which is the logging solution in AWS, is enabled. And basically the way CloudTrail works is it puts logs into an S3 bucket for that region. So uh, this is... Not everybody sets up the cloud trail in every region and you should have it in every region. You should also have validation enabled. So this checks that as well. Uh, validation is on by default these days. I don't know why people would turn it off, but uh, it is possible to turn it off. So uh, it's a good audit check. So moving on to user data. So we talked a little bit about that in that Terraform example. So. Uh, EC2 instances and you know the virtual machines within EC2 have a lot of metadata associated with them, just like virtual machines in ESXi or Hyper-V or whatever, there's metadata associated with them. The user data uh, piece of metadata is potentially one of the most interesting uh, pieces of metadata because it is essentially a base64 encoded string that is the machine startup script. And so it supports Bash for Linux and PowerShell for Windows. And this is where somebody can go really off the rails and put all kinds of interesting stuff in, in the user data. And so I wrote a tool, and when you uh, when you use the AWS uh, command line tools, I think it dumps it as base64, so it's not as obvious that you know what it is, what it is. Uh, so the tool I wrote, uh, which is called Describe User Data, it iterates through all of the regions, and when it finds an instance that has user data, it just dumps that, makes a nice table, and dumps it to the screen. So in this case. From putting an access key and uh, a secret into, you know, a uh, environment variable. So, this is another area of potential privilege escalation. Or you might find information about the environment. You know, where the server gets its updates from, or where, you know, all kinds of stuff. Right. What the what the machine does as it boots up is basically what is in this uh, what is in this file which uh, is a good thing to enumerate.
Next up, we've got uh, S3 versioning. So this is a an S3 bucket. And a bucket is kind of like, if you're familiar with Windows, it's kind of like a file share. It, it's just a folder with a bunch of files in it and that multiple people can access if they have the right permissions. Uh, except it's done over HTTP and it's not, you know, uh, it's the security is better thought of, I guess. <laughs> it's not based off stuff, stuff from the 90s and the 80s or whatever. So, um, and S3 versioning is very cool because it allows you to keep every version of changes that has happened to a file, which, uh, you know, when people overwrite a file, you know, they can restore back to a previous version or if they accidentally delete stuff, they can restore the, the deletion. Uh, so this bucket has versioning enabled. And right now it's just a static website. You can actually host static websites out of an S3 bucket. It's a very common uh, thing to do. And one of the ways that you, if you're in the console, as we are right now, can know that versioning is enabled is first of all, in the properties, you've got versioning it says it's enabled. The other thing is this little toggle switch that shows uh, by default, it hides all the versions, but you can show them uh, by hitting the toggle. So how can we exploit this uh, if we get access uh, to this S3 bucket via an API key? And I basically wrote a tool, when, when the file is deleted from the bucket, uh, it's not, it still exists as a versioned item but it just goes into this thing called deleted markers and it's marked for deletion and it can still be restored, but it's no longer shown, uh, you know, at, unless you uh, show all versions of everything in the bucket. So what I did is I wrote a tool that uh, is called describe deleted items. You basically say, okay, uh, describe deleted items and give it a bucket and then it goes through and takes a look through at uh, any deleted items that it finds and gives you a list. So this is kind of what this looks like. And so what had happened in this bucket is somebody had accidentally uploaded some AWS credentials and you even know the owner, I've obscured that uh, here because uh, it's me. And uh, these, uh, these credentials are, are still there they're just marked for deletion. And so what that means is every version of this file, there could be multiple iterations of this file if it's changed over time, has a unique version ID. So the key, which is the name of the file, may not change uh, when the file's updated, but each instance of that file, each updated version of that file has a unique version ID that you can query for and download, even though it's been deleted. So uh, basically what I say in, this, in the output of the script is, if deleted objects were found, you may be able to download them with the following command. Just remember to include the correct key and version ID. And basically uh, you use the, this is the AWS uh, command line interface again. You basically say, okay, this is the bucket I wanna download from, this is the name of the file, this is the version ID, and this is where I wanna write it to. And then at that point, you would have the credentials file, okay? All right, so let's talk about logging into Linux and Windows hosts. So the default way that you log into a Linux host in EC2 is when you create the virtual machine, it says what SSH key pair would you like to associate with the first user on the box? And then from that point, if it's an Ubuntu machine, uh, you know, or if it's a, I, I think Debian uses root, uh, Amazon has their own Linux and it's called, the user was like EC2 user or EC2 dash user or something like that. So there's a whole bunch of uh, different default names. You take the key pair and you log in uh, to that house. If it's internet accessible, we'll talk about why things shouldn't be internet accessible uh, or at least management ports shouldn't be internet accessible in a little bit. Um, I want to build some, scr some, uh, some scripting to, to show this, but uh, right now I just have a, uh, an AWS CLI query that I, 
I write and basically it shows instance ID, what platform it is, whether it's Windows or not, and the public IP address associated with it. Um, and it will give you a list of Linux hosts. So if you do get access to, uh, you know, a dot, there are always .pem files unless the person's renamed it, I think. I, I don't, maybe they, they support uh, PuTTY's format as well, I can't remember, but I've always just created pem files. Um, you may be able to log into the hosts in, in the environment uh, with that uh, key pair. So Linux hosts by default, you know, use good public private key uh, authentication, which is good. And Amazon had a problem to solve on the Windows side of things because how, you know, you can't use a SSH key pair or, or even public private key authentication to log into a Windows host, uh, unless you, you know, consider Kerberos, but that's, that's another story. Um, so the way they handled it in the GUI in the console is they have this thing where you can get the, you can retrieve the password from uh, AWS. And they basically store the password encrypted using an SSH key that is associated with the instance at creation. And so in order to get the password, you need to, um, you need to provide the SSH key that is used to decrypt the encrypted blob that Amazon is uh, using to store the encrypted password. And then it reveals the unencrypted password to you. So to better illustrate how this works, you have, uh, in the console, and remember there's feature parity between the API and the console uh, for the most part, you have username and password, you know, maybe you have multi-factor authentication. That's, that authenticates you, lets you know that you are like allowed to even look at this stuff. Uh, and then the private key is used to decrypt the blob that is stored at Amazon so that even they don't know what the password is after they've encrypted it. And after that, you get a Windows password, which is the actual credential. Uh, but authentication is much easier with API keys. And so with, when working with API, you just need keys, API keys for the authentication, and you just need the private key for the decryption. And sometimes these files are stored, you know, together or uh, in, you know, the same vicinity on a machine. Like if, if you can find an API key, you could probably find a private key if you get on a developer's box or a, uh, an IT person's box. And I wrote a script that takes those two things and uh, gives you the Windows password. And, and this is what that looks like. So this is called get EC2 win creds. And basically you say, this is the uh, region that my machine is in, or this is the region I wanna check actually, because it checks every, every machine in that region. And then you list the file that you wanna uh, have it uh, decrypt. And this basically prints you out the password for that instance. And so you hopefully, if you have RDP access to this box, you can then RDP into uh, that machine with this password. All right, this is my favorite example because it's like the most complicated one and it was the one where I was like, I don't even know if this is really possible, but I'm gonna try it and it worked out. So one of the things that I've been talking about is like SSHing and RDP and it's like, well, what if you don't have the capability to do that? You know, there's either an ACL or a security group that is blocking your network access from the location that you're at, but you can still talk to the Amazon API. And so what I did is I wrote a script that basically can exfiltrate uh, files if you know where they're gonna be from an instance. So you got your virtual machine, it has a volume or two or eight or however many it has. And basically what we're gonna do is in order to get the files off of this, let's say it's a domain controller, because that, that's the thing I used in the example. We know where the files on a domain controller usually are that we want to get to, right? We know where SAM system security and 
uh, ntbs.dit are located on that file system. So what I did is I wrote a script that requires a lot of permissions, but it's a cool demo. Uh, and basically what it does is it spins up an attacker instance within the environment that is based off of uh, AWS Linux. It takes a snapshot of the volume that the, in this case, domain controller is. It mounts that volume while uh, the machine is booting. Uh, the script also creates an S3 bucket, which is used for staging. Um, it was the best way I could think of actually exfiltrating this without direct network access to the box. Uh, even in most lockdown environments, most uh, EC2 virtual machines can still get to S3. Uh, and basically, so there's a, an S3 bucket that's set up with the correct permissions. Uh, using a startup script on the virtual machine, it dumps an encryptor onto the box that encrypts the files and uploads them to S3. And then the script that's running on the attacker's laptop or desktop or whatever, then once this is all complete, downloads the files from S3 and, and decrypts them. Uh, what's cool about this, uh, this script is, this could be, this is using it for like red team purposes. There's nothing to say that this couldn't be used as a, like a way to exfiltrate like a full image of a volume. Uh, it probably wouldn't work with the script as it's written because the encryption solution I'm, I'm working on or I'm using uh, doesn't handle like, you know, 10 or 20 or 80 gig files very well. Uh, but uh, you could change that. And if you're interested in doing that, let me know and I, I can probably point in the right direction. Um, so basically, this looks super complicated. It's like uh, when I came up with this concept in my head, I was like, I don't even know if it's possible. So. Uh, so I have a, a little video uh, that, and actually, I, uh, I guess I can set this up. So one of the scripts I wrote is describe instances, which is a, a thing that you can do in the AWS CLI, but I think this shows it a little bit better. There's other things I want to add to this um, that are currently not in it, and I want to add some, some command line switches and stuff. But uh, basically, in this example, we have a domain controller that we see that we have. It could be running or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, and we see the volume ID uh, that we want to clone. So basically we need to know what the files are, what region this thing is in, which it's in US East one, and we need to know the volume ID. Uh, and we, we're gonna feed that into the script and I'll show you what that looks like in this little video. Now let me actually bump up the quality a little bit so that you can actually see what's going on here. So basically we, we have a parameter that's called files.txt which has our SAM system and security and ntds.dit that we're going to pass to the script. We're going to run describe instances uh, and see, okay, here's our DC with the volume. And because it's, it's SDA1, we're pretty sure that's like the C drive of the virtual machine. Then we run get ec 2 filespy We give it the volume ID, the region, and the parameter that has the list of files that we want to exfiltrate from that domain controller. And the script creates the staging S3 bucket. It sets permissions on that bucket. It starts to create a snapshot for that volume. It then attaches that snapshot to the attacker instance of uh, Amazon Linux, loads the startup script into that instance uh, with all of the encryption data as well as where to send it in S3. It creates that instance that's a sped up, uh, but normally it takes about five or 10 minutes for, for that to, to actually complete. 
uh, once the instance is done completed, uh, uh, done getting set up and it, it automatically shuts itself off and deletes itself. And then the script that's running on this machine then downloads the files that have hopefully been uploaded to the S3 bucket and decrypts them. And so that's SAM system security. And ntds.dit, it then deletes the bucket, the snapshot, and the instance. And let's see, does it do an L, do we do, we, do, we do an LS? We see that we've got our ntds.dit SAM system and security. So we just did all of that just using the API. We didn't actually have any uh, like network access to the box. All right, one of my favorite demos. It's 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 a pretty cool uh, cool demo, I think. And it's kind of complicated to wrap your mind around what's going on. So it's like you may have to watch that video again. So. That, that's, uh, that's the type of stuff that uh, Red Dolphin does. Uh, we're going to talk about some things to do to defend against the stuff that I've just shown you. And we're going to show you some uh, other tools that you may want to look into that are great uh, for auditing, defending, and even getting uh, information as a, as a red teamer or pen tester. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about AWS networking first. So like I, I like to use the, the Galaxy Brain meme for this because I think when people uh, start uh, using AWS, it's, it's sort of like an, uh, a journey that everybody's on. And, you know, you start with like small brain, you got your management uh, interfaces on the public internet. So you've got SSH and, and RDP publicly exposed. Anyone can get at them, try to brute force them. And, you know, you've, you've probably read all kinds of stuff where people have gotten hacked this way. So definitely, you know, don't want to be doing that. Uh, human brain, you start to limit changes, uh, network changes via IAM. So this is like, can all of your IT people and developers uh, change network stuff in uh, in AWS, or is this you know just your networking people who like probably know what's what's what a little bit better, or are they the only ones that are able to to actually do this? Uh, glowy brain is when you start having ACL restrictions and security groups. So this is, this may be, you know, you can get to port 22 that is directly on the internet, uh, but you can only do it from, you know, this IP address, which is our data centers or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever it may be. Um, uh, brain explosion is having point to point VPN tunnels that go, that put you directly onto the networks in AWS. Uh, you know, that way you could have a, like a network tap and, and you know, monitoring a little bit better uh, and you're not putting stuff directly on the internet even if there's an ACL in place. And then like Nirvana brain is like monitoring your network changes and traffic. Okay, that's like the best of the best. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the journey you wanna be on with, with AWS networking. Um, there's other ways that we've, that we've talked about that you can, you know, like the, the alerting on credential searching is one we talked about in terms yeah. of like logging and monitoring, setting up cloud trail, uh, you may want to consider logging regions you use or that you don't use more, not less. I think people are like, well, why would I log a region or care about a region I don't use? Well, if you have somebody who spins up like 3000 EC2 instances to mine Bitcoin, like you might care about that in you know south south east asia or you know western europe or whatever that's something you might might care about again make sure log validation is on and also do monitoring i you know it's it's funny how many times i've been on a pen test and like you know the really cool logging solution didn't catch me it wasn't the you know whatever, you know, whatever, like, physical person was working that day, it was, like, literally IT noticed that a box was, like, w working weird, you know, you know, wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. And uh, so monitoring can, can also be uh, super helpful, and uh, AWS has solutions for that as well. Within identity and access management, 
try to have somebody working for you who actually understands IAM. It is super complicated. It's well designed, in my opinion, but it's like very difficult to understand uh, well. And uh, so that may mean, you know, hiring somebody. That may mean like training somebody. You know, sometimes we have to like train people too. So um, make, make sure they understand least privilege. You can do cool things like uh, have your users log in via SAML or like, you know, some sort of federation thing and have multi-factor authentication that gives them like short-lived API keys that are good for like an hour or 12 hours or something. And if somebody pops their box, it's like, well, those keys expired, you know, three days ago. Um, and that's a really good solution for, you know, your, your human uh, people that, uh, you know, may get fished. Uh, for the services and, and machines that actually have to have long-lived API keys that, you know, are good for six months or a year or longer, uh, you know, can you lock down those AP, API keys to only be usable from certain, certain IPs? And you're like, well, you know, it might be hard to know where, where these API keys all are. And it's like, well, if that's a problem, then how are you gonna be able to rotate those keys if they get compromised, right? So knowing where your keys are is part of being able to rotate them. And so this locking down where API keys can communicate from can really narrow the, the field from where you actually have your API keys. Because you know that they're coming from, you know, this data center or this, you know, AWS VPC or whatever. Uh, so those are the recommendations. Other tools to consider. So uh, NCC Group does Scout2, uh, which you can sort of think of as like um, sort of like a nessus of, of cloud and uh, basically supports multiple cloud uh, environments. It only requires audit access, uh, security audit access within AWS and whatever the equivalents are of the other platforms. And uh, gives you really nice HTML reports that you can like give to your clients or, you know, you can you know, peruse yourself to find interesting things. Um, and if your client customer environment or whatever, you know, is working on logging and monitoring, if, if, if they can't detect Scout 2 being run, then, you know, they have some work to do because it's running a lot of stuff. A lot, a lot of these, a lot of these tools. Are that way. So this is uh, drilling into a report. Uh, you know, it, it shows happy green bars for things that are doing well, red bars for areas that you know need some attention or need to be reviewed further. Uh, really good, uh, really good little tool uh, for sure. Uh, cartography, which is uh, made by the people at Lyft, and uh, I know the guy who, or one of the people that. Uh, works heavily on it and is, is really trying to build an open source community around this. I've been to the, the cartography meetups uh, online and uh, they've got a Slack uh, channel. So if you're, if you're looking to get involved in a, uh, an open source project that's a little bit more established, uh, cartography is really amazing. Uh, it's a good community and the people behind it are, are, are doing a really good job too. But basically what cartography does, it's very similar if you ever use Bloodhound, uh, it enumerates stuff from your AWS environment into a Neo4.js uh, database, which is the same backend that Bloodhound uses. Uh, it's not quite as polished as Bloodhound. Uh, you have to kind of learn the query language a little bit better uh, or a little bit more, um, but it's, it, you know, it's like an hour of your time probably. And so, for example, you can do queries like, show me the relationship between AWS accounts and like my databases, okay? Or show me all of the S3 buckets that have uh, public permissions, uh, you know, that type of thing. And uh, you can do a lot of really interesting queries that uh, make it very visual. It's not just better for you to see what's going on. It's also makes it very easy to communicate the problem to other people, uh, which is uh, valuable as well. Uh, there's a ton of other resources, but uh, if you're looking to do a CTF uh, that is in AWS, flaws.cloud and flaws2.cloud, uh, they are a little tougher than I would like them to be, and it's kind of hard to do a CTF in AWS, but uh, they 
there's good write-ups for them if you're, if you're getting stuck. So uh, definitely take a look at them. Uh, they will, uh, if you've never set up an AWS environment, it's sort of, uh, the, the write-ups can walk you through that, that process pretty good. So another really good tool is uh, something called Prowler made by Tony Blix. And, or Tony Blix, I don't, I don't know. I don't know who this person is. I've never met them, but they make really good tools. Uh, basically, it's very geared towards like CIS benchmarks uh, and best practices. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like Scout uh, in that it's sort of an auditing tool, but uh, it's uh, very CIS focused and is the biggest bash script I've ever written. I've never, I've never seen a project that is uh, such a big uh, bash script. So, um, Also, Arsenal of AWS security tools, it's broken into different uh, areas of security. So offensive, hardening, uh, defer, etc. You can get a good idea of like how active is the project, how many people use it, you know, that type of thing. A uh, really good list of, this is probably the best resource I've seen of uh, AWS uh, tooling in security. So, and that, thank you for coming to my tech talk, or uh, TED talk. Basically, that's, uh, that's, that's all I got. Uh, I'm Jim Shaver. I'm the latest most places around the web. If you are looking for a mentor in the AWS space, feel free to DM me. My DMs are open. So uh, feel free to let me know. I can get, help you get set up. You know, I think people, when they, when they think uh, AWS, they hear like dollar signs. And like, I think I spend between five and $20 a month on my environment. Most, most months it's like $10. Uh, and I've, you know, I've written all these tools with that budget. So it's, uh, it, if you do it right, it's, it, it can be not super expensive. Uh, it, it just requires you to sort of understand how the pricing and, and the cost works and whatnot. So, and check out Red Dolphin. Um, and uh, I definitely have a lot of ideas around where I would like to take it. I wanted to do better error checking. Uh, and I like to make it a little bit more targeted uh, for some of the stuff I'd like it to be able to say, okay, just this instance rather than, you know, uh, iterating through all regions in all, in, you know, all instances, that type of thing. So uh, that is my presentation and I thank you and I will happily take any questions that uh, you have. Thanks for the awesome presentation, Jim. Uh, I'm sure now your, your uh, inbox is gonna be, be full with DMs but we have a few questions here. Uh, one of them is it- is Stun it silence, I will also accept. <laughs> Someone said, it's, is it fairly common to find API keys in unsecure S3 buckets? Um, no, and actually I just realized that my speakers uh, stopped working uh, at some point during here. So I hope you haven't been trying to talk to me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so unsecurity S3 bucks, I mean, so, I would say not, uh, no, I mean, it depends. So there's like, uh, one of the, you know, the, you can do like public listings on buckets. Uh, if you can find an API key in there, that's great. Uh, it really depends on the maturity of the environment, um, you know, that you're working in, I would say, so. And another question we have is, what would be the countermeasure for the get EC2 files script? Yeah, excellent question. I really like that question uh, because there's a lot of ways that you could um, you could uh, stop that from happening. So, like, uh, one of them is have least privilege on your API keys. Uh, so, if you could you know, do something with the EC2 instance, but you couldn't set up an S3 bucket, that would break it. Uh, if you had to be coming from a certain IP with your API keys, that would stop it. Um, if uh, you have very tight uh, network ACLs and security groups, uh, that might stop it. Um, there's um, even more advanced ways that you could probably uh, 
you could probably stop it. But I mean, the big thing is, and and also you also want to make sure you have logging in place so that you actually know that this is happening. Okay. And we got another question. I think this was from back the network management portion, the slides with the different mines. The question is, does does this work if they are using Secrets Manager? Uh, and yeah, and which slide was that uh, related to? Sorry. The, the slides with the different brains and one of them, I think, might have oh, been yeah. question, the network manager. Um, you know, I don't know enough about Secrets Manager. There's, there's a whole bunch of sections of AWS that I still need to study. Uh, Secrets Manager is one of them. Parameter Store is another one of them. Uh, it's something I'm working on. I don't have a good answer to that question. And I don't know which, uh, and there's all kinds of stuff that happens when like you're using uh, KMS or Cloud HSM to like encrypt things that makes things just more complicated. Uh, what's, what's, what's really cool about KMS, uh, which is a key management service, uh, is that you can, it's, totally managed encryption. So like uh, you can say, you know, Alice can encrypt and decrypt this thing, but Bob cannot. So like Bob may have uh, access to an S3 bucket, but can't decrypt the content. And so it doesn't matter uh, that Bob has access. And one last question someone had here. I've heard that doing pen tests against AWS is highly restricted and that you have to get explicit permission from Amazon. Is this true? And if so, have you come across issues from Amazon with running any of these pen tests? So I, uh, I don't consult anymore, uh, but my understanding is that you used to have to get permission and Amazon set up a process uh, for that, and they were so overwhelmed by, or I don't know, I assume they were so overwhelmed by the process, they said, yeah, go ahead, it's your infrastructure. Uh, you know, here's some general uh, ideas. I, I don't know that I'm not your lawyer, uh, so uh, you may want to verify that, but that is my understanding uh, that Amazon has uh, changed the, their stance on that, and that used to be true. I don't think that is true anymore, but uh, do your own. Consult your own legal advice on that one. That's all the questions we have, but really appreciate you giving this talk. It's, it's kind of nice to see now more information coming out on, on these related topics. I've seen even SANS is offering like a cloud pen testing course now, and then Black Hills, I believe Information Security Group was offering something too. So it's good to see more of that coming about because I know trying to find information used to be kind of tough. And, yeah, and I think the the problem with new areas of technology and security and all this is like you have that like constant chicken and egg problem of like, do you have people doing research in that area? Uh, are there certifications that are incentivizing people to know this stuff? Uh, you know, a lot of the cloud certs right now are very like vendor specific, which is usually what happens <laughs> with new technologies is like, you know, you're in, in Novell Netware, uh, you know, <laughs> certified person, and then, you know, at some point you're, you know, network uh, certified, you know. Uh, so they, they get vendor, they become vendor ag agnostic over time, hopefully. Um, so, you know, it would be really great to, to see a SANS or, uh, or another, uh, you know, the other uh, cert certification bodies uh, really, uh, you know, uh, get better at, at those certs. And you know what, it's funny too, because like uh, I've, I've given this talk in a couple of ways, uh, you know, talk to people about it and that type of thing. And like, I'm really surprised at like how many, you know, companies and people that I never thought would have gone like Azure or AWS that are like moving into the cloud. So it's, it, I think it's happening um, whether, you know, whether we like it or not. And uh, we, we kind of have to start thinking about this stuff uh, more and more. Yeah, and even just from a standpoint, a lot of people moving their their Exchange, Outlook, and Microsoft Office to the cloud, at least that much. But yeah, I yeah. See, see the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, even, you know, Google's in the space too, and, you know, people are moving to, to their stuff as well uh, to some extent. So, 
it's uh it's very interesting there's a lot of uh a lot of work to be done uh, we have we have a lot of uh a lot of work to do if you're uh, if you're interested in this space uh, there's there's plenty of uh, trails to blaze so well thanks again for your presentation thanks everybody for coming and uh if, you know if, if you if you if you weren't comfortable asking a question now feel free to dm me or, or hit me up on twitter and uh, i'd be happy to take your question that way too thanks everybody for coming out thanks